Explore new worlds and new ideas through programs like this. Made available for everyone through contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. You, and only you, capital Y-O-U, are the subject that impacts the burning desire in your imagination. Best-selling author and beloved spiritual teacher, Dr. Wayne Dyer, returns to public television with his newest and most astonishing offering yet, Wishes Fulfilled. You must be conscious of how you use these words, I am. I am strong. I am well. I am content. Even if your senses tell you something different, I am. Learn the five Wishes Fulfilled Foundations, five steps to manifesting your deepest desires while living from your highest self. If you would like to accomplish something, you must first expect it of yourself. Join Dr. Wayne Dyer on a joyful journey to create your most extraordinary life when Wishes Fulfilled airs next. You are living and feeling as if your future dreams are a present fact. God bless you. I appreciate it so much. Oh, thank you, thank you. I am Wayne Dyer, and I am well. In fact, I am perfect health. And by the time this program is over, you'll have a much clearer understanding of what those words really mean. It's just great to be back on public television. We've been doing public television pledge shows since 1998. Um, my children were raised, I have eight of them, and they were raised on public television. Uh, little Barney things were all over my house for so many years. <laughs> and of course, uh, I think of public television as one of the great energy systems coming into our homes, and uh, I'm proud to be a part of it, to support it, and to help raise money for it. It's our national treasure, and I'd hate to think of what would ever happen if we lost it. The show is called Wishes Fulfilled. It's uh, based on a book that I have just completed. I spent the last year or so in writing it, researching it, living it, practicing it, and have come to a place in my heart where I know that it's really not so much about what you want in terms of what you manifest, it's who you are. You manifest what you become as a human being. And this program is about teaching you to become the highest consciousness being that you can be, to be aligned with your source, to be aligned with God. And when you are, you become a creator and a co-creator in your life. I'd like to open this program with a uh, poetic offering from Samuel Taylor Coldridge, who wrote The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And he also wrote a poem that I used uh, earlier in my life in one of my earlier books, Real Magic. Listen to the words and ask yourself if, um, if, they really, if they really mean something to be true for you, if you really believe in what the poet is offering here. He says, what if you slept? And what if in your sleep you dreamed? And what if in your dream you went to heaven and there picked a strange and wonderful flower? And what if when you awoke you held that flower in your hand? Ah, what then, the poet asks. Do you believe that it's possible to bring something from the world of the formless, from the world of a dream, into the world of the physical? The poet was speaking metaphorically, but I am not. This is really a program about applying those words in your own reality. 
Most of us were raised to become ordinary. And I'm not putting down ordinary, but ordinary is just not good enough for me. <laughs> ordinary is you go through your life and you fill out the forms and you pay your taxes and you do what your parents tell you and you're honorable and you're honest and you're a good citizen and then you die. <laughs> Extraordinary is something very, very different. This is about recognizing within yourself that there's something very, very extraordinary that you haven't been trained to believe in to come to a place where you can apply it and put it into your life. And I want to say to you that I have been working in my life at living an extraordinary life, and so many powerful things have happened to me I'll be sharing with you throughout this program. But more than that, you can go way beyond ordinary. You can go way beyond just being average. There's not an average person watching this show. There's not an average person in this room tonight. All of us are extraordinary. We just have to come to believe it. There was a friend of mine, her name was Portia Nelson. Portia passed away a few years back. She lived up in Seattle. And she was at a seminar, and they asked her to, and they asked everyone to write on a five by seven sheet of paper or card uh, the five chapters of their life. They only wanted to give them five by seven cards because they didn't want them to get too wor wordy. And Portia Nelson sat down and wrote these words about the five chapters of her life and I thought I would share them here with you. They're so beautiful. She said, chapter one of my life. I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I'm lost. I'm helpless. It isn't my fault. And it takes forever to find a way out. Chapter two of my life. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. <laughs> I can't believe I'm in the same place. It isn't my fault. And it still takes a long time to get out. Chapter three of my life. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there. I still fall in. <laughs> it's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. It's my own fault. And I get out immediately. Chapter four of my life. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter five of my life. I walk down another street. <laughs> Isn't that great? Portia Nelson. I walk down another street. And this is another street. Look, it's called New Street. <laughs> Old Street. <laughs> Walking down another street means leaving behind ordinary. And when I use the word ordinary, it has deep and profound meanings to me. Ordinary just simply isn't enough. Ordinary is when you want to become average and to fit in. But to get to extraordinary, what you do is you have to consult the invisible place within yourself. And this is called your soul. And your soul, well, I jotted down a few words about the soul based on a lecture I heard from a great teacher of mine who lived in Bulgaria. He was an Asiatic science teacher. And his lecture was very profound. And I w wrote these words after listening to one of his recorded lectures. He said, the ideal of the soul, the thing it asks for is neither knowledge nor light nor happiness. The ideal of the soul is space, immensity. The one thing 
your soul needs is to be free. Free to expand and reach out and to embrace the infinite. Yes, the ideal of the soul is infinity. It is miserable when it is circumscribed and restricted. It is a fragment of the universal soul, which is infinite. That's what I speak about here in this program. The, the need to move beyond just fitting in. The need to move past being circumscribed. The soul does not like when you get fenced in, when it is told what to do, when it's told it has limitations, when it's told it can't become that. And so many of us go through our life with these enormous limitations that we've placed upon ourselves that have been handed to us from the time that we were little boys and little girls. If you look on the screen, you'll see of something that uh, is very important and powerful to me. I was swimming not too long ago up in Minneapolis. I went to see my daughter, uh, Tracy. And up and down, I would swim in the pool. And every time I would look up, I would see this written on the wall. And I thought, as I was preparing to do this program, this is just so important and significant. If you would like to accomplish something, you must first expect it of yourself. And my question to you is, what do you expect of yourself? Do you expect to be able to perform miracles, to attract into your life the kind of prosperity that you are entitled to? Do you expect that you can manifest the kind of relationships that you would like? In order to be able to have these kinds of expectations for yourself, you have to make a dramatic change, a dramatic shift. You must change what's possible for you and what you believe is possible for you. But the question becomes, who am I? You know, I've been teaching philosophy for 40 years now, either at the high school level or junior high school level or university level, graduate school. And now in stages all over the world and in front of audiences such as this, watching at home and here this evening, who are you? And what is real? My teacher in India, his name was Nisargadatta Maharaj. He was asked the question, Swami, what is real, Master? What is real? And his response was, that is real, which never changes. So what part of you is real by that definition? Who are you that never changes? So many of us believe that we are our bodies. <laughs> I don't know about you, but uh, <laughs> this body that I'm in right now is changing all the time, very fast, as a matter of fact. In fact, I, Wayne Dyer, the I that is I, have been in many, many bodies since I incarnated for this first time here on this planet, right here, 71 years ago. So I was in a, oh my goodness, look here. <laughs> what happened to that body? <laughs> and there, there's another body that I was in, and there's another body. And oh, there's my brother Dave, and there I am on the right, another body. And then I was in, look at that haircut. They did it with garden shears in those days, but I lived in foster homes. There I am, look at that hair. Can you believe that? Is that, uh, is that possible? <laughs> and then I was in this body, and then I was in this body. And I have been in toddler bodies, baby bodies, teenage bodies, macho bodies, <laughs> mustache bodies, <laughs> endless bodies I have been in with my little ones and my eight children. And the fact of it is that when you think about it, when I was in the 20-year-old body that I was in, I really thought it was real. Didn't you? I mean, even the body that you and all of you look at your body and think, well, let's see, I was in a 20-year-old body. And um, is it real? Was it real? Well, you believe that it was real, but I've been looking for that 20-year-old body for 50 years now. <laughs> I can't find it. And the fact of it is, the body that you're in right now 
is not who you are, because it doesn't meet that fundamental definition of what is real. What is real is what never changes. The fact is that who you are keeps occupying new bodies every single moment that you are here on this planet. There was a great poet. Her name was Emily Dickinson. I feel like she was, must have been a sister, a, a, a soulmate of mine. She once had a poem. She said, uh, holding up a handful of dust, she would reach down and say, this quiet dust was gentlemen and ladies and lads and girls was laughter and ability and sighing and frocks and curls. This passive place, a summer's nimble mansion where bloom and bees fulfilled their oriental circuit, then ceased like these. That's who all of us are if we identify ourselves with our body. The fact is that everything in this physical universe doesn't meet the definition of what is real. Who you are is that soul that I spoke about a few moments ago. That soul that says, I want to expand. I want to be free. I want to go to a place where I understand that who I am is birthless, deathless, changeless, and live from that place. Because what this involves fundamentally is reprogramming yourself from the belief system that has been your ego. The part of us that has come to believe that who we are is what we have. And who we are is what we do. And who we are is what other people think of us, like our reputation. And who we are is separate from each other. And most egregiously, who we are is separate from God, from our source. And so we've been raised and taken out into the world and said, go out there and prove who you are by achieving, by accumulating, by getting other people to like you. <clears throat> I wrote a book and did a film not too long ago called The Shift. And one of the, thank you. <laughs> and in there I spoke about and used these words. The direction we take in life is far more important than the place that our ego parks us in this present moment. That who we are is this divine, infinite being that keeps occupying new bodies endlessly until we leave this body and then move on. And there is no beginning. There is no end. There is only now, each and every one of us. So the soul, the part of you that is extraordinary, the part of you that came into this world and knows I can be anything, I can do anything, I can accomplish anything that I place my attention on. Because if you want to accomplish something, you must first just Expect it of yourself. And this means changing around the expectations that you've been conditioned to believe are your dharma or are your destiny. I am limited. I am <coughs> not entitled to prosperity. I am unable to deal with my physical ailments. I need something else. I need to take pills in order to do it. I need to have somebody else do it for me. That within each and every one of us, there is this marvelous knowing that is really and truly God ourselves, each and every one of us. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're very kind. You're very kind. Over the years, I've written many books, 37 of them to be exact. Um, this, um, what has come to become really clear to me in the last few years of my life is that there really are, um, there really are two selves within each and every one of us. Um, Muktananda called the ego, the part of us that has edge got out, E-G-O, edge got out. 
the false self. And the false self is uh, this part of us that is not authentic. It is, um, it is the ego. This false self is the part of us that is always trying to, trying to win, trying to own things, trying to prove itself. We send our kids off to school and we tell them, you know, be ahead of everybody else, win, no matter what, and so on. And, and they have a tendency just to believe that who they are are these bodies, even though the body they're in is going to change and you'll never be able to find it again. <laughs> and then there's within each and every one of us a higher self. And this higher self is, um, is really the soul. It's really the spirit. It's really, it's really God. But these two selves are sort of constantly at, you know, they're not at war so much with each other, but there's, uh, there's this battleground that we have within us. I'll give you an example of it in my own life. Um, somebody on the internet, a guy named Watkins, has put out a list, because there's lists for everything. The 100 most spiritually influential people alive. And they put out this list, 100 people. And they rank from number one to 100. And I'm on the list. I'm one of the, yeah, thank you. Not only am I on the list, but I am, according to this list, and they've got all this criteria of how you get on this list, I am the third most spiritually influential person alive. How about that, huh? So the spiritual part of myself, my soul, the higher place within myself, um, says to me, this is not relevant. <laughs> You're not any better than anybody else just because somebody has put you on a list. In fact, you shouldn't even, be cons you shouldn't even know about that list. And perhaps the people who are most spiritually influential aren't even on that list and don't even want to be on that list because they don't care about those kind of rankings and comparisons and so on. But then there's the ego <laughs> <laughs> over here that says, what do you mean number three? <laughs> well, what's going on with that? And who are these people who are more spiritually influential than you? And how are you going to take them down? <laughs> so there's this sort of constant thing about it shouldn't make any difference. Who I am is, uh, you know, is the same as everyone else. We all come from the same place. And we all return back to the same place. But um, then the ego says, let's see, the two people ahead of me on this list one of them is Eckhart Tolle, <laughs> but he had Oprah. <laughs> and she's only number eight on the list anyway. So. And he got on there every week, and that's not fair. So, And then there's the Dalai Lama. And I figure Eckhart and I maybe can get together and take the Dalai Lama out of this thing. <laughs> or maybe I should align with the Dalai Lama and uh, anyway. The ego is doing this, um, this number on us. But there's also the part of us that is divine. And this is the place that I'm addressing here in this program. There's a quote from Joel Goldsmith. Uh, Joel wrote so many great books. A parenthesis in eternity was one of them. And this is what Joel said. He said, then there are those who reach a stage in which they realize the futility of this constant striving and struggling for the things that perish, things which, after they are obtained, prove to be shadows. It is at this stage that some persons turn from this seeking for things in the outer realm to a seeking for them from God. And that's who you tuned into today on this program. I have left this... Uh, pursuing things, and money, and fame, and winning, and being better than others. It's taken me a while, but it has been, it has been a, a powerful journey. As a matter of fact, I had said to uh, my ex-wife, um, <clears throat> I said, can you imagine? Did you ever, in your wildest dreams, 
Could you ever have imagined that you would be married to the third most spiritually influential person alive? And she said, I just, she said, they didn't call me when they made that list. And she said also, she said, I don't want to um, upset you, dear, but you're not in my wildest dreams. <laughs> I said, well, all right. <laughs> So moving to this higher place is, uh, is really um, understanding that in, in the second chapter of uh, Wishes Fulfilled, uh, I call it the higher self. And it gets defined very specifically by this great Bulgarian teacher. His name was Omram Mikhail Ivanov. And he was teaching what's called the initiatic sciences. And I have had um, his teachings show up in my life in a very powerful way. I've studied his uh, writing. I've listened to many of his recorded lectures uh, that took place back in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And, uh, <clears throat> and I, I, I brought a quote of his that I'd like to share with you. Our higher self is perfect, omniscient, and almighty, a fragment of God himself a pure, transparent, luminous quintessence. I love that. I love great writing like that. And that within each and every one of us, there is a place inside of each and every one of us that is all-knowing, that is almighty, that is actually a fragment of God. He then went on to say, the creator has planted within every creature a fragment of himself, a spark, a spirit of the same nature of himself. And thanks to this spirit, every creature can become a creator. And this means that instead of always waiting for their needs to be satisfied by some external source, human beings can absolutely work inwardly by means of their own thoughts, their own will, and their own spirit to obtain nourishing, healing elements that they need. This is why, he said to all of us, the teaching I bring to you is of the spirit of the creator and not of matter. A spark, a spark that is in each and every one of us.